Welcome to the 24th Annual Power of Nursing Leadership. Please welcome Dr. Eileen Collins, Dean of the UIC College of Nursing. Good morning, and welcome to the Power of Nursing Leadership Celebration. I'm, Dr. I'm Eileen Collins, and it's my pleasure to join you, not for the first time at this event, but for the first time as Dean of the UIC College of Nursing. On behalf of our college and the 2021 Power of Nursing Leadership Event Host Committee, we welcome you as we proudly mark our 24th year of celebrating exceptional nurse leaders throughout Illinois and the many sectors in which they practice. I am so glad that we can be together in person today, both in person and virtually, to celebrate nurses' contributions to healthcare during yet another challenging year. It is vital that we take this day each year to laud the impact of Illinois nurse leaders, notably as our profession continues to lead the charge on the front line of this global pandemic. Will the host committee please stand? Thank you to the host committee members for their invaluable contributions to the success of this event. They are Marianne Alexander, Gloria Barrera, host committee chair Susan Corbridge, Laura Ferrio, Lorna Finnegan, Diana Halford, Ann Lundy, Melissa Murphy, Jeff Murphy, Susan Acuno Jones, Bina Peters, Brenda Schmitz, Janet Stiffner, Susan Swart, Sue Thompson, John Tressa, Susan Vonderheide, Joellen Wilbur, Katie Corbridge, and Steve George. Let's give them another round of applause. We are all here today to celebrate the impact and achievement of nurse leaders in the state of Illinois, as well as to enhance and engage partnerships among leaders in academia, government, healthcare delivery, and healthcare services. I am honored to be here today among such prestigious healthcare leaders. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge just a couple of the esteemed guests who are joining us today. Representative Lakeisha Collins of the Illinois 9th District, Tim <laughs> Timothy Colleen, President of the University of Illinois, and Robert Barish, UIC Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. Thank you for showing your support to our state's nursing professionals who continually make a, a vital contribution to the healthcare delivery and policy in Illinois. In honor of Veterans Day, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our nation's servicemen and women, and especially to thank all of those with us today who have bravely served our country and protected our freedoms. Will the veterans here today please stand? Thank you for your service. We greatly value your sacrifices and your contributions to the work we do and the care we give. Over the past 23 years, this event has become a showcase for outstanding nurse, nursing leadership in Illinois. On that note, 
Today, we are fortunate to have a welcome from a very notable nurse leader, Illinois Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Hi, everybody. I'm Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, and I have the honor of representing Illinois's 14th Congressional District, and I'm a proud nurse. I'm excited to be joining you for the 2021 Power of Nursing Leadership event. I'd like to begin by thanking Dean Collins and all the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing leaders, faculty, staff, and students for the opportunity to join you for this celebration of the impact and achievement of nurse leaders across our state. It's so great to be back with you after our conversation earlier this year for the Nurses Belong on the Hill virtual event. Back in February when that event was hosted, the COVID-19 pandemic was killing nearly 2,000 Americans every day. And while COVID-19 vaccines have saved many lives over the last nine months, our communities continue to suffer from this pandemic and our nurses continue to make heroic sacrifices. In fact, since the very start of the public health emergency, nurses have been on the front lines of the crisis. Nurses have provided excellent clinical care for patients at great risk to themselves and their families. Nurses have been in laboratories conducting high stakes research on the coronavirus and how to keep people protected against it. Nurses have continued to teach future generations, sometimes through computer screens, ensuring that nursing students are equipped with the knowledge, skills, and inspiration they will need when they go out and serve in their communities. Nurses have carried out critical public health initiatives from COVID-19 vaccination efforts to the ongoing work that needs to be done to address threats like substance use disorders, gun violence, and climate change. And on top of all that work, nurses have made their voices heard as the advocates at the local, state, and federal levels, building support for policies to strengthen the nursing workforce, expand access to high quality care, and address ongoing health disparities. And through it all, nurses have remained committed to the North Star that drew us to the profession in the first place, the desire to ensure that people can thrive, the recognition that nurses can make our community safer and healthier, and the purpose that comes from a life dedicated to serving others. As one of just a few nurses in Congress, I am proud to carry the lessons I learned in my clinical training with me every day in the work I do. My nursing education grounded me in a data-driven, evidence-based approach to policymaking that centers the patients and communities impacted by the legislation I write, the votes I take, and the issues I champion. Some of the most important work I do in Congress is to advance policies that will strengthen our nursing workforce. As a member of the House Committee on Appropriations, I prioritize securing robust funding for Title VIII nursing workforce development programs and the National Institute of Nursing Research, ensuring that our nursing students, faculty, and researchers have the resources they need and deserve. I also teamed up with Senator Jeff Merkley to unveil a sweeping agenda to support nurses on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, including access to testing, treatment, PPE, paid leave, child care, and mental health resources. But the need to support our nation's nurses will extend far beyond the public health emergency. That's why I've also introduced the Future Advancement of Academic Nursing Act, which would make a historic $1 billion investment in schools of nursing to strengthen nursing education and grow the future nursing workforce. And I am so excited to report that this bill was included in the Build Back Better Act advanced by the House of Representatives, bringing us one step closer to providing the funding that will be needed to address current and future nursing shortages. The Build Back Better Act advanced by the House also included two of my other top legislative priorities. The package includes my Health Care Affordability Act, which would lower out-of-pocket health care costs by expanding premium tax credits, ensuring that no American is forced to pay more than 8.5% of their income on premium. And the Build Back Better Act legislation also includes every eligible provision of my Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, a sweeping set of 12 bills to address the clinical and non-clinical drivers of our nation's maternal mortality crisis. From funding to address social determinants of health to investments in the perinatal workforce, including resources specifically for schools of nursing. These critical provisions will expand access to high quality health care and address health disparities. But the mission to save lives and advance health equity will require an all hands on deck approach, not just policymakers, but clinicians and public health leaders, social service providers, and academic researchers. In other words, we need nurses. We need you. 
The expertise, training, and passion that nurses bring is needed now more than ever, not only to finally defeat COVID-19, but to emerge from this pandemic stronger than before with a renewed commitment to the health and well-being of our communities, especially the most vulnerable among us. You can be leaders in this difficult and necessary work. As policies are shaped at the local, state, and federal levels, your voices must be heard on the issues that matter to the nursing profession and the patients you will care for. All throughout the pandemic, elected officials have praised nurses and applauded our healthcare heroes. So when you call your representative or senators to talk about the legislation that invests in the nursing workforce or policies to expand access to care, they're gonna listen. And don't be afraid to look for opportunities to become policymakers yourselves. Whether that's answering the call to serve on your local public health board or even running for Congress. You have all the skills, the knowledge and expertise that you need. You are ready and your communities need you. I know you're up for it and I can't wait to see all that we can accomplish together. So thank you again for the opportunity to join you for this Power of Nursing Leadership event. I look forward to the day that we are all back together again in person, but until then, take good care of yourselves. I just love her, don't you? She's just, <laughs> can't say enough good things about her. So our thanks to Congresswoman Underwood for her support of Illinois nurses and for her impassioned call for us as nurse leaders to use our influence to affect healthcare policy. I hope that the networking that you find here offers you an opportunity to engage with other nurse leaders and that this event will inspire new thinking for you as you enact your leadership. And of course, we want you to enjoy yourselves. An event like this takes the support of so many people and we could not do it without generous aid from our sponsors. I extend special thanks to Diamond Leader and presenting sponsor, UI Health, Platinum Leader, and Sage Awards, Sage Awards sponsor, Loyola University Chicago, Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing. <laughs> Platinum Leader and Joan L. Shaver Outstanding Nurse Leader Award sponsor, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Silver Leader and Centerpiece Sponsor, ANA Illinois. Sil Silver Leader and Group Photo Sponsor, U Chicago Medicine. Bronze Leaders, Access Community Health Network, and Chamberlain University. Thank you to all of the exhibitors this year who shared with us their exciting innovations, initiatives, products, best practices, and achievements. And we, the UIC College of Nursing, are thrilled to host this distinguished event. You might say we celebrate the power of nursing leaders year-round by educating and graduating hundreds of RNs and APRNs each year. While our UIC campus was quiet, the important work continued teaching and learning, caring for patients, adapting, discovering, and innovating, persevering with determination and grit. The world is changing. The importance of your degree won't. We are the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing, Illinois' leader in delivering undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral nursing education. For the past 14 years, we have been recognizing pinnacle leaders, individuals selected by their organizations to be honored for their leadership talents. Today, we again celebrate 22 of our colleagues as pinnacle leaders. These individuals have been selected for their extraordinary service in the nursing and healthcare fields, for making positive, lasting changes in their work environments, and for having acted as mentors to others. Our pinnacle leaders this year are Mary Applequist, Rush Copley Health Medical Center, <laughs> Kelly Banks in Norse, University of Illinois Hospital, <laughs> Denise Banton, Rush University Medical Center, <laughs> Wendy Bostwick, UIC College of Nursing. Susan Buccelli, Loyola University, Chicago Marcella Newhouse School of Nursing. 
Debbie DeGrazia, Loyola University Medical Center. Carolyn Dickens, UIC College of Nursing. Carmel Iger, Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Cherise Franklin, UIC College of Nursing. Kristen Grazzi, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Michelle Hayland, Rush University College of Nursing. Carol Kostovich, Loyola University Chicago, Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing. Maria Bennett McKayling, Loyola University Medical Center. Seatsai Mersha, UI Health. Crystal Pawnon, Chamberlain University. Kiana Player, UI Health. Monique Reed, ANA Illinois. Paige Rika, UIC College of Nursing. Elizabeth Stewart, Rush University Medical Center. Colleen Wigman, Shirley Bryan Ability Lab. Tara Urinich, Loyola Medicine. And Connie Zack, Oak Point University. It's inspiring to know that we have such a remarkable cadre of leaders who are advancing local, national, and international health care. Thank you to the 2021 Pinnacle leaders and their supporters. It's a very noteworthy distinction that you were selected by your peers for your leadership. Why don't we give them one more round of applause? At the beginning of lunch, I ask that the pinnacle leaders present please gather on the risers to the stage left for a group photo. This year, we had a number of very deserving nominees for the SAGE and the Joan L. Shaver Outstanding Illinois Nurse Leader Awards. These were not easy choices. Thank you to the 2021 host committee for performing the very difficult task of evaluating and selecting from the pool of extraordinarily qualified candidates for these awards. I also thank all of the nominators who put forth the remarkable slate of candidates for this year's awards. A special thank you to Loyola University Chicago Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing, spon the sponsor of this year's SAGE Award. The SAGE Award was created to spotlight nurses who support the leadership of today while always looking for ways to mentor the nurse leaders of tomorrow. This year, we're honoring Dr. Dina A. Nardi, psychotherapist at Cathedral Counseling Center in Chicago, and Dr. Lee A. Schmidt, Executive Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Assistant Dean of the PhD Nursing Program, and Associate Professor at Loyola University Chicago, Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing. So how do we define a SAGE? A SAGE makes a significant impact on the careers of others by providing advice, guidance, and enlightenment. The SAGE influences and shapes the careers of others by sharing wisdom and experience, illuminating possibilities, acting as a guide who helps others along their career paths towards the leadership opportunities, and offering insight to help others navigate challenges and take risks as role models, facilitators, and mentors. Dr. Nardi, would you please join me at the podium? The following excerpts from the nomination of Dr. Nardi are a few examples of how she has invigorated others as a SAGE mentor. One nominator wrote, 
as an inaugural diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee member of ANA Illinois, Dr. Nardi serves as a selfless role model and advocate for fellow steering committee members to bolster their scholarly and professional contributions related to social justice and inclusion. She challenges us to look through an anti-racism lens and is unwavering in her commitment to educate the ANA Illinois nursing community and students on strategies to achieve equity in nursing healthcare, education, and practice. In the wake of the rac racial reckoning and disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on racial ethnic groups that have been historically marginalized, Dr. Nardi, a senior member of the group, supported the leadership efforts of the committee to develop a coordinated response of workshops, resources, and diversity leadership award for ANA Illinois members. Another nominator said, Dr. Nardi has been instrumental through my development from assistant to associate professor with tenure, and then becoming a full professor at a Carnegie Level One Research Institution. I am an associate dean and have modeled characteristics embodied by Dr. Nardi. It is with great pleasure that I present the 2021 Power of Nursing Leadership Sage Award to Dr. Dina Nardi. Thank you. I've been fortunate to work with nurses who've stood up, never shut up, and made a difference in the lives of their patients and how we as nurses can negotiate the choices we make in our practice on a day-by-day -day basis. I just want to name just a few of them from when I started as an RN up to now. First, Mrs. Maida, never knew her first name, Little Company of Mary Hospital Surgical Intensive Care who uh, took a new grad, diploma grad, under her, her wing and taught her everything. Dr. Doris Blaney, Indiana University Northwest School of Nursing. Dr. Roberta Waite, many of you know her. She has written so many anti-racist essays, research, policy uh, from Drexel University. Dr. Marie Lindsay, ISAPN. Dr. Maria Connolly, uh, Loyola University. And the women of passion and purpose I work with now in the ANA Illinois Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Expert Panel Steering Committee. Doctors, Carol Alexander, Tamara Bland, Dr. Samendia Clark, Monique um, Reed, and Gloria Barrera. These nursing leaders and all of you who are committed to make positive changes in healthcare, you are the true power of nursing. Thank you all. Dr. Schmidt, would you join me at the podium? The following excerpts from the nomination of Dr. Lee Schmidt are just a snapshot of how he truly embodies the definition of a sage. Dr. Schmidt is a servant leader who embodies all qualities of a sage by leading up with his dean and others, leading down and developing leadership in others, and leading sideways to build relationships and drive good leadership decisions. Another excerpt from his nominations, Dr. Schmidt challenges students to think and grow in and outside of the classroom. He is a great role model for students and junior faculty who feel inspired to teach. Dr. Schmidt is creating a legacy of mentoring among his mentees, and we are each better for having worked with him. A third person wrote, he has helped me navigate the sometimes choppy and unpredictable waters of administration. He has guided me to recognize the challenges in this role are opportunities for personal and professional growth. He has never failed to support me on this adventure, the hallmark of a true mentor. And yet another said, he not only provided me with mentorship, but also continuously challenged me to view things from a different perspective and grow in my administrative and leadership skills. He is a great example of someone who is always encouraging fellow nurses to become leaders. It is with great pleasure that I present the 2021 Power of Nursing Leadership Sage Award
to Dr. Lou Smith. I'd like to start by thanking the members of the host committee for selecting me for this award. I am truly honored. I also want to thank my dear colleagues who nominated me for this award. Dean Lorna Finnegan, Dr. George O'Connor, Dr. Susan Bouchelle, Dr. Carol Kostovic, Dr. Mary Byrne, and Dr. Regina Conway Phillips. Please know how touched and humbled I was by your words and know that I treasure the opportunity to work with you each day. You're all truly special to me. Over my career, I've encountered many individuals who have had characteristics associated with SAGE, and I'd like to take just a few minutes to honor them and publicly acknowledge the significant impact they had on me in my career. To the late Dr. Imogen King, who wrote a single phrase on the paper I submitted for the concepts course in my master's program. She wrote, please consider going on for doctoral studies. <laughs> I did get a grade, though, so this <laughs> um, But that single phrase got me thinking about possibilities I haven't even encountered. To my dear friend, Nan Dr. Nancy Hogan, who was a member of the faculty panel who interviewed me for the admission to the PhD program at the University of Miami. When the interview was wrapping up, she proceeded to lay out several specific reasons based on my interview responses of why she hoped to see me in class in the fall and why the program at UM was the right program for me. And I have to say she was right. Throughout my education, Dr. Hogan had a significant influence on my growth. She opened my eyes to the excitement of discovery and after she retired from UM and joined the faculty at Loyola, she was also instrumental, and some might say persistent, in encouraging me to apply for the faculty position, and I'm so glad she did. To Dr. Doris Sugariza, who, with her arms crossed, asked me during my interview for the PhD in nursing program at the University of Miami, Mr. Schmidt, what's your definition of professional nursing? <laughs> I will admit that was not the question I was expecting. <laughs> And I'll also admit there were a few beads of sweat on my brow as I thought about how I was going to answer that, sort of similar to what I'm feeling right now. Um, <laughs> but I did return to that question many times in my career, and I think that was very influential in shaping my understanding and my focus that the patient's viewpoint of nursing care is so important to us. And finally, to Dr. Dina Nelson, who was Chief Nursing Officer with Tampa General when I was the Director of Nursing Operations there. When I finished my program at UN, I had an offer to join the faculty. I met with her, we talked briefly about my role at Tampa General, and she said she'd make a counteroffer if I wanted her to, but honestly, she felt I could have a, more of an impact if I joined the faculty. That was just another one of those conversations with a trusted advisor that opened possibilities to me that I never really considered. I'm very blessed every day to be surrounded by my colleagues who bring qualities of SAGE to their work. They influence me in many profound ways, and it's why I'm so honored and humbled to accept this award. Thank you. Congratulations again, Dr. Nardi and Dr. Schmidt, on your well-deserved awards. For more information on all of our award recipients, I encourage you to read their inspirational bios in the program. As we proceed to celebrating the next awardee, I want to thank Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, sponsor of the Joan L. Shaver Outstanding Nurse Leader Award. Since the very first Power of Nursing Leadership event 24 years ago, one of our greatest traditions is honoring an exemplary nurse innovator with the Joan L. Shaver Outstanding Illinois Nurse Leader Award. Over the years, we've honored 23 outstanding Illinois nurse leaders. I'm grateful that several of them are joining us for today's event. Dr. Delaney, would you please join me at the podium? Outspoken, extremely generous with her time, <laughs> humble. These are just a few of the many attributes used to describe Dr. Kathleen R. Delaney, professor in the Department of Community Systems and Mental Health Nursing at Rush University College of Nursing. 
Dr. Delaney has made a marked impact on healthcare through her passion for creating safe and healthy psychiatric environments for children and adolescents, as well as improving our knowledge of the nursing workforce. Currently, Dr. Delaney is implementing a Child Community Psychiatry Nurse Practitioner Fellowship. In collaboration with Catholic Charities and Russia's Section of Community Behavioral Health, she focuses on new models to coordinate psychiatric services with community-based agencies. In 2019, Dr. Delaney was appointed chair of the Illinois Nursing Workforce Center and became active in disseminating Illinois nursing workforce data. She currently serves on the American Psychiatric Nursing Association Workforce Task Force, which is conducting a national survey of psychiatric nurses. Her policy efforts around workforce adequacy led to her receiving the National Organization of Nurse Practitioners Faculty's 2020 Outstanding Policy Award. Her nominators best described how Dr. Delaney embodies the essence of the Shaver Nurse Leader Award. One of them wrote, and I quote, there are many unprecedented issues facing our state and country that influence the mental health of our families and communities not the least of which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Delaney stands ready always to help. As the pandemic hit Chicago and took its most devastating toll on the weakest and the most vulnerable, she quickly joined forces with a behavioral health resource team to provide respite services to COVID positive persons experiencing homelessness. For Dr. Delaney, this is business as usual helping wherever and whenever she perceives a need. Another nominator said, as a longtime colleague of and collaborator with Dr. Delaney, I have personally witnessed her commitment and expertise. I often rely on her insight and pragmatism to help move new initiatives forward. She consist consistently shows herself to be willing to work across disciplinary boundaries to advance the mental health care of the people of Illinois. And finally, the lives she has touched and healed are too numerous to count. Please join me in congratulating a truly deserving recipient of the 2021 Joan L. Shaver Outstanding Illinois Nurse Leader Award, Dr. Kathleen Delaney. I'm so glad I've got my friends at Rush here. To <laughs> oh, I, I'm so overwhelmed by this, um, but I, I want to thank you all so much and for the people that nominated me and wrote very kind letters that were quoted from, much too much. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the committee and the organizers of this event. For, since really 1998, your efforts has made tangible the strength of nursing leadership in Illinois. And that's just an important part of what you've done for our state. Uh, to the U of I School of Nursing, uh, just across the street from me at Rush, my whole career, and I have many good friends there, but I've always long admired your level of research and scholarship and your public health focus. And I'm so pleased that I've had associations with you over the years. Um, to Rush, uh, all the, all the people that are here today, thank you. And throughout my career to the deans and chairs that have supported my movement between practice to research to education. Um, many, many fiddling around with my distribution of FTEs over the years. <laughs> I told the dean uh, that it used to be you just filled out a slip and wrote what your FTEs were gonna be that year. And she said, if only it was that easy. Um, finally, thanks to all the nurses in this room who work to improve hospital and outpatient services and, and build models of care that are effective for our patients. And to those in this room who recognize that traditional health care is not always good for particular populations. As we move forward, things are clear to me. We need to continue to build treatment systems that improve the well-being of the underserved. 
and in many cases, that is going to mean untraditional models of care. We need to develop methods to finance these models, and we need to build data to support their effectiveness. The economist Yui Reinhardt once said, nurses are like insurgents. They're occasionally beaten back, but they'll win in the wrong run. They have economics and good sense on their side. Well, I'd like to add to the late Mr. Reinhardt that I also think nurses have on their side a deep sense of patients and what they need. And we also have on our side listening to the collective wisdom of nursing around building healthcare models. So indeed, this is our time to transform healthcare. Thank you. Congratulations to our exceptional colleague, Dr. Kathleen Delaney. Before we convene to enjoy our lunch and the lovely company at our tables, I'd like to announce that we're offering group photo opportunities over to my left from 12.30 to 12.55, and again from 2 to 2.30. And our keynote by Rear Admiral Susan Orsega, check your Power of Nursing Leadership virtual event bag next week for the information about viewing and downloading photos. I now invite the pinnacle leaders to join me for a group photo, and everyone else, please enjoy your lunch. Welcome back to the 24th Annual Power of Nursing Leadership. Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you so much again for coming. I am Susan Corbridge. I'm the Executive Associate Dean at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. And I have had the honor and privilege to again be the chair of the host committee for this event. I am so very excited that we're able to be here again in person. I am now very honored to introduce you to this year's keynote speaker, Rear Admiral Susan Orsega. You may recognize Admiral Orsega as one of only a few nurses to hold the title of Surgeon General. She held this role, absolutely. She held this role in an acting position from January 26th to March 25th of 2021. Admiral Orsega has led a distinguished career of public health service starting in the late 80s in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps at the National Institutes of Health to Chief Nursing Officer of the United States Public Health Service to today where she serves as Director of Commission Corps Headquarters. In her current role, she is responsible for directing all functions regarding personnel, administration, operations, readiness, deployment, and policy for the 6,000 officers of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Admiral Orsega serves as the principal advisor to the Surgeon General on activities and policies related to Commission Corps training, preparedness, activation, deployment, and total force fitness, including the activation of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps to support the national COVID-19 vaccination effort. We are very grateful to have Admiral Orsega with us today, especially as we celebrate leadership and the capacity that we, as nurses, have to improve health and influence policy to better serve our communities. And several of us were fortunate enough to be in D.C. this past uh, Monday at the um, AACN meeting where, where Rural Admiral Orsega was also honored with a policy award from AACN at that time. So please welcome me to, with, to welcome Rear Admiral Orsega. Good afternoon. I'm hoping that everyone can hear me. And uh, good afternoon, Susan uh, Corbett, for that really nice uh, welcoming. Um, and, and congratulations uh, to all of those awardee recipients. And uh, greetings to you from Washington, D.C., to all of my Illinois uh, nurse colleagues and those who are coming uh, from around all the other states uh, to this 
really a remarkable uh, meeting. So uh, before I delve into uh, what I believe is certainly um, a critical and important topic, I actually just wanted to thank you. Thank you, um, Susan and the organizers who put forth um, a really uh, a lovely day. And I wanna particularly acknowledge the unsung heroes. Um, as many of you who've been on the pandemic front lines um, or really have been trying to battle as best as we can policies, practice and programs, um, I certainly wanna recognize all of you. And, and COVID has impacted everything as we know in our lives, our, our health, our work, um, our play, and, our and certainly our relationships. So I wanna recognize you for all of your leadership and the important of, importance of having this meeting uh, because these continued conversations and influence on addressing not only COVID-19, uh, but really the health of the nation is, is so, so very paramount. Whether it's working at uh, clinics, institutions, organizations, at the bedside, boardroom, or even at the blackboard, um, working with the impoverished uh, to the imprisoned in rural areas or urban areas. Uh, nurses are the scaffolding uh, for those who have no access or little access to healthcare. And they're seeking answers, not only to the pandemic, but this complex world as we know with healthcare delivery. And so as nurses, all of us, um, as we go where most don't usually go to provide care for vulnerable and, and underserved populations, uh, we respond to, if we think, you know, from the natural disasters in the past, to disease outbreaks like uh, COVID, and even global health emergencies, um, as well as humanitarian missions. What a breadth and depth of responsibility and response that we do. Um, we work on these front lines uh, because we translate what I believe is making the impact uh, that we're, do we're doing in the communities in ways that no other profession can do. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about my perspectives um, and uh, go through what I think is uh, again, critical as we move, uh, move ahead uh, in all of this journey. And um, those are, I'll just move ahead. Um, so as we know, uh, COVID, uh, COVID has, uh, we think about this pandemic, you know, we can bridge that message of vaccines. Um, and as we know now, even broader, what are the vaccines availability to those who are the younger group of ages five to 12, and that awareness of public health measures to communities we serve in. You know, COVID has taught us uh, to make sure we're reaching out to these communities um, and talking in different ways about public health. And whether it's that public health emergency, it, that is that HIV epidemic in 1980s or the influenza pandemic in 1918, you know, nurses can tackle these issues head on, but we have to utilize our networks and our influence. We have to utilize our networks and our influences and our influence just like this in this meeting to help build solutions and to be those bridge builders. You know, having worked at uh, the Department of Health and Human Services as the Commission Corps Headquarters Director, and now more very recently, a newly appointed as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Surgeon General, and, and the pleasure and, and real distinct privilege to serve as an acting Surgeon General, I've grown to understand that you can lead in a purposeful, humble way uh, in really any environment, but it's my previous experiences uh, working at the NIH and in a variety of different uh, um, countries with very complex environments that has allowed me to realize the importance of, of collaborations, whether it comes to public health or to leadership. And they're working in, with various disciplines in various sectors, uh, we can come together and, and solve those complex health problems uh, and clearly communicate the solutions. So today I'm gonna to share with you my perspectives on how to navigate uh, through these complex, because I believe it's our logic and our leadership tools that will allow us to advance. So interestingly enough, uh, when we think about the, the current COVID situation, um, we also have to look at uh, where we were in the pandemic. And, 
And you know, certainly every day is a starking reminder of the pandemic um, because we, we and, and certainly all of the children right now that are challenged um, with both the virus and, um, and certainly getting the vaccine. You know, if we look at the coronaviruses and how they surpassed um, the numbers uh, that many, none of us would ever have realized in, in the fall months of this year, it's really a, a challenge milestone for this country. And we've in fact exceeded the number of cases in COVID-19, uh, or excuse me, in the 1918 Spanish influenza. Uh, but the good news is, is that as of October 27th, um, so almost 70% of the people are fully vaccinated in Illinois. So, um, and the positivity rate is around eight to 9%, but we have to remain on guard uh, because we are public health warriors. Now, when you look at the, the Spanish influenza, it was the first great collision between our environment and our modern science. And certainly uh, what's striking is that it started in January of, of 1918 during the height of World War I in a small town in Kansas. And in fact, it, this individual physician was kind of pondering why so many people were getting sick. Um, and, and certainly they were young individuals who were getting sick. And so he's really perplexed by that. And in fact, um, recognized that more, as more and more individuals were becoming sick, um, he began to collect and record, uh, record this. Well, 300 miles away, in fact, in an area where Fun, it was called Funston, Kansas, um, all the army personnel that were uh, in the county, uh, in that county in Kansas, were actually reporting to this uh, small town for training. And of course, on the weekends, uh, individuals would visit um, them at the, in Funston, or soldiers would come home from being on leave. Um, but they realized that around March, so January, they were collecting it, and then March, uh, the first soldier uh, became ill. Within three weeks, more than 1,100 other officers were sick enough to require hospitalization. And then thousands more it became this cascade ripple effect. And it turns out that that county was only reporting about a fraction of the death rates um, in the US. Then that year would kill at that time more people in 24 weeks than HIV killed in 24 years. So what happened in that, in that time is that the United States Public Health Service, the very uniform I wear, and the Red Cross co um, collaborated to bring together physicians and nurses and supplies in the communities of most need. And the Red Cross, as you can imagine, brought, um, brought the nurses and they brought gauze masks and the supplies. And then um, the United States Public Health Service, because at that time they were exclusively a physicians, uh, were only, uh, uh, they were only employing physicians or, uh, and, and, and becoming to, to become officers they moved in and would diagnose and then move to the next area and the nurses would stay behind and actually provide the supportive care. And it, interestingly, at that time, nurses in fact were at times responsible for quarantine areas. Now in 1918, the United States lacked a uniform policy for limiting uh, publics and contact in public gathering places and with no central authority to create or enforce the rules each community acted on their own. October 4th, in fact, the United States Surgeon General at that time, Rupert Blue, he recommended closing all public gathering places. So if you can imagine closing all public gathering places, that sounds pretty familiar. And if you look back in the history of public health predictions, they actually then became reality. Lessons like this in 1918 should influence our approach to COVID-19. I want to talk about some heroes because heroes are really um, remarkable in that they give us some inroads on how we should be um, in really becoming our, uh, all of us as leaders. And if you look at every four years, um, I love uh, the Olympics and that Go USA spirit really permeates all of our surroundings from the commercials you see to the cereal boxes 
um, and in fact, every hour of the day is consumed with just a lots of national pride. You remember Simone Biles. She gave us lessons so, to reflect on this year. This superstar withdrew from five Olympic medals over mental health concerns and something that we know now is called the twisties. She persevered through uncertainty and digging deep into her soul with really that integrity to do what was most important for her and her health. And this took precedence over the pressure to perform. And during that entire time, her team supported her with compassion and care. And that was evident certainly on TV during the matches when her team comforted her during this decision. And she cheered her fellow teammates on from the sidelines as Americans and teammates in that fight, in our fight to combat COVID-19 and other public health crises. This is an important example in taking care of others as a nursing profession. In, 1990, in 1944, Surgeon General Perrin, in fact, appointed Lucille Petrie, another hero. She was the very first chief nurse officer and very first female to wear the rank of rear admiral in the uniformed services to lead the largest number of nurses called the cadet nurses at that time. And during the three years of the existence, as you can see on the screen, um, under the Bolton Act, it provided the greatest historic reservoir of trained nurses for the military and prevented the collapse of a civilian nursing service on the home front. These were, and are still today, our hidden heroes. Mrs. Minnie Carter, who you can see in the bottom screen, that is two, two rows in uh, from me on the very end um, in the lower right-hand corner. As she worked at a time when most places in America did not let races commingle in the workplace, she shared with me how hard, immensely difficult it was for her to do rotating shifts and enduring insults and just constantly uh, challenges um, for her character during, from various patients. And sometimes she was the only black registered nurse on duty. However, Mrs. Carter transformed these events into positive learning lessons, she told me, and experienced a prosperous and fulfilling career, making inroads that none of us would even dream of, ending her career at the NIH. These are all powerful heroes for all of us uh, to inspire in our profession, to see how they took courage in, during challenging times, to know what to do what was right, uh, certainly reflecting on the cadet nurses at a time when our profession is challenged by the number of, op by, by the number of nurses in our profession. But they took creativity, they took courage, and they took challenge, and they are heroes. Our jobs aren't easy. And in fact, with limited resources, uh, with COVID-19, limited manpower, we must learn to be resourceful. If you think about um, what resourcefulness is, we all remember this when we went into our nursing profession, the resourcefulness that you had on the night shift. But really resourcefulness, I say, is that ability to use that knowledge and skills that you don't necessarily have at your disposal, but you're gonna affect change and hone your leadership because you may never have all the resources you have in your organization, but you certainly have the tools within your profession and the use of others who have shared goals to achieve that task at hand. For me, a resourceful moment came actually at the onset of COVID-19 pandemic when our United States Public Health Service nurses were set to deploy to that then at that time, the epicenter of the pandemic in New York City. It was a phone call that I made to Dr. Eileen Sullivan Marks, who you may know at the NYU, when I needed nurses, our public health service nurses, to get trained on the use of ventilators. So I called her. She had at her fingertips nurse experts at NYU that had real time delivered real time training. And within half a day, in fact, we had training that was made available to our 30 nurses who deployed up to the Javits Center, which you actually can see in that picture. Um, 
And we were, the, that team was quickly able to work with us to have the training so that we could then be prepared to, for the anticipating a thousand patients. The resource of public health networks really proved immeasurable at that time. If you think of collaboration, we often see, say, you know, collaboration, I've seen this in a quote before, the most critically ingredient for collaboration, especially with people who are diversely different, is really that mutual respect. And you can take that and apply it to anywhere from our professions, in the settings, in a hospital, or to humanitarian disaster. And while nondescript, you know, working in our profession is powerful and is very influential. And certainly we have all of these ingredients with the health disparities um, and providing and the drive to help provide access for all, all and opportunities for all. But a lot of individuals just don't have access to care. Um, but we know nurses can collaborate, but we have to look at and view ourselves as those collaborator constructs because we are powerful partners we're community collaborative leaders um, and we can work as trust translators but we have to view ourselves in that way and right now when you have a setting like covid and vaccines and complexities of information um, we very uh, have the ability to get into these communities and to talk to each of these individuals in these communities in a way that um, are the others in other profession don't have the, the training and the skill. But we certainly learned this. We learned it in Ebola uh, when trusted leaders were communicating out to tribals, tribal uh, nations and tribal areas. And certainly in the HIV epidemic where you have community stakeholders and faith-based leaders there is no reason in my mind that nurses can't go out to those sectors and we should go out to those sectors to making sure that we're going out to communities to speak to faith-based leaders, to speak to community stakeholders. And this should be the same as we're also working with mass vaccination plans and also other educational strategies. Capitalizing on the moment is an optimal time to make that case or expanding on your nursing programs and attracting more people into the profession through all the tools that we have at our fingertips. We all know there's a workforce shortage and certainly the need for nurses on every spectrum from the new nurse to the mid-level nurse, a nurse practitioner to doctorally prepared nurses and, and it's certainly in our academic centers is becoming increasingly more worrisome and certainly because of the economic and workplace challenges. As we know from the American Association of College of Nurses, if you haven't seen, there's a number of increasing baby boomers, as we all are, um, and they're reaching ages of greater than 65. Many are even retiring. So we have this moment of urgency. So during this moment of urgency, we have to think creatively and how to ensure that we're expanding nursing programs, that we're attracting and branding each of, and as you think, each and every one of you in all of the programs that you're involved in. That moment will, 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 will shorten and then we will lose them out on that ability to capitalize it. There's solutions working to lift up our, our profession and solutions to being more equitable across our healthcare systems is, is no is no other is no other challenge than it right now, and we see this working with communities. If you think about again nurses and our ability to have our voice, and we all know that very well, because if you take a look at the communities and seeing ourselves as nursing as nursing leaders, um, many if just taking one small example, if you look at urban areas where sidewalks are sometimes unkempt and crumbling and kids and adults, um, you know, they're unlikely to, to access uh, and go outside and they sit at home. But nurses can make an influence in those communities. Nurses can actually be present at community housing boards and we can influence the ability for walkable communities. We just have to view ourselves as working across all of those different sectors, whether that's government, city planners, community organizations, to address these growing chronic disease issues and poor health habits and challenges 
when people are, are access to care. And the, the small inroads, they're small, small inroads to really make those powerful, in, but maybe make powerful impact by having a nurse sitting on a community board. And certainly, as we think across our profession, our workforce, um, and we want to lift, and we will lift up our, our communities as we lift up our pro profession. Um, you know, fortunately, as we look at all of the of nurses and delaying and all the challenges of delaying gradu graduations, um, it's made incredibly more difficult for all of you who are in the academic settings because of social debt. Distancing, distancing that has made it even more challenging. But still, I say there is an opportunity here to work with communities because quite honestly, there's a, a growth and a peaked interest to come into the nursing profession. So now more than ever, should we be working up, working with communities to talk to them about the voice of our profession and to help, under, help nursing students or help students who may be interested and eager to learn about nursing, to help them understand what we do and the breadth and depth of what we do. And finally, the cognizance of our surroundings. As we know, the world is connected you know, more than ever. And distance is no longer a barrier uh, from a disease or an endemic. And we know that with Ebola, and certainly we know it now, um, because it takes, it could take two countries. Matter of fact, if you think about it, it's very far away from each other. And you can connect them within a moment of a flight in a 12 hour period, very far away, you can connect them. Or a ship that has passengers that with, off, with individuals with vastly different cultures, but one common risk, the epidemiology and the spread of a disease thinking about the Diamond Princess cruise ship. We have to be poised. We have to be poised as nurses and keen observers in the practice of, of global health here at home and to be those healthcare de de detectives abroad to stay and keep those future pandemics uh, from reaching the United States soil. And if you think about disease, it only requires a small opening to spread in this tight, tightly connected tightly connected world. And looking at Ebola, reflecting on Ebola is, an, is a good example because individuals, if you talk to the nurses, when the individual was infected in, in Dallas, they never thought that an individual would have the disease in their own backyard, but it transformed this endemic from a very far away disease to something that hits home. And you can't always prepare for an, an infectious disease or, or a global health crisis. In fact, preparing for these remarks today, I was reviewing some of my notes from a speech I did in uh, 2019. And my remarks, I stated that you can only be one step ahead and we must remain our vigilance and our advocacy in a cultural preparedness for that next Ebola. And here we are. You know, when, when we are providing services to communities, we have to be innovative and we have to gain that cultural capital with patients because not everyone can take off in the middle of the day to get vaccinated or uh, seek care. And in fact, the picture that you see in the lower left-hand quadrant of your screen um, is one where an individual who was seeking to get tested was in a ranch. And so what the team did was they identified the areas that, were, that they knew that they needed to get out to reach to do COVID testing, and they brought testing to those areas that were hard to reach. I mean, that's a small stride, but it's the innovation like that that brings care to the areas of the country that need it most. And furthermore, we have to take an account to the impact that climate change has had on our surroundings. You know, in the past decades, 2.6 billion people around the world have been in fact in, impacted by earth, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. You know, nurses have been pivotal in safeguarding the public during and after these times of disasters. And sometimes, you know, we face these crises both sim simultaneously. The nurses are on the front line 
and they're educating and protecting people. They're engaging with and building trust with communities and helping people prepare for and respond and helping those in, in the farthest areas to recover by fostering that resiliency. So I wanna take a little time now just to talk a little bit about the United States Public Health Service. The United States Public Health Service is led by the Assistant Secretary for Health. And as you can see from our uniform, we respond and have responded um, and by my remarks, to a variety of different types of disasters. But I wanted to spend a little time talking to you about this because we have right now an exciting opportunity. We're active mission corps officers, but we also have ready reservists, which is our, our component of our, of our uniform service, well, just like every other service, for those individuals who are in civilian set, in settings, nurses, or any other one of our 11 professional categories. And we, when there's a disaster, we are now have the opportunity by, the, for, by the, the CARES Act to now activate and call officers up to be ready reservists. So you can be a civilian and then you're activated to be United States Public Health Service Commission Corps officer when there's a disaster. I encourage you to look at www.usphs.gov if you're interested to become a Commission Corps officer and to deploy when you're needed to respond to the nation's call and then return back to your communities that you're serving in. And certainly as a former United States uh, acting Surgeon General and the longest standing public health service officer, you know, my vision and my hope is through my legacy is that we build this and we continue to preserve all of our Commission Corps and rec be recognized as Americans' health responders. So in closing, you know, nurses, um, when you look at nurses as innovative leaders, and certainly reflecting on many of the priorities of many different um, some strategic plans, including the American Academy of Nursing, which released the policy priorities for 2021 and 2022, it actually, um, they all talk about health equities, and they talk about championing wellness, promoting innovation, and reducing patient and provider and system burn burden. But certainly, it's about that vision, that vision of for healthier life for all people. And one thing I've learned throughout my career is in order to, uh, for us to be prepared to that next public health threat that we may face, we have to work together. We have to share our knowledge. We have to be cross-sector, thinking outside of the box, cross-collaborative. We have to intersect our talent with our strengths and passions to others. Because combining with those elements together will allow us to advance our profession, to be those nimble architects. We also have to think broadly about our capability. Because it's if not when, or if not now, then when. And if there'll be another profession who will come along and be innovative. So it is our time to do this. And the world will get better. But we have to come together. And we have to be those change agents that we think that we are, and we have to recognize ourselves as those change agents, and certainly as our health as health architects. You know, throughout nursing, nurses have been champions for those less fortunate and underserved. Nurses have to lean in to be decision makers. You know, sometimes nurses' voices are not heard at that nurse at the decision making table, and you know, some of it is a reality. But it doesn't mean that we should be a silent or accepting. We are the largest voices. And so therefore, we can make it to be our most powerful and measured success. In this current condition that we're in and the climate is so difficult. And many Americans have this pandemic fatigue from those who are on the front line to those who are on the front porch of their homes. We have to be embracing patience with every situation that we're in whether it's walking in the grocery store and seeing and following those public health per precautions, helping individuals understand the importance of the public health per precautions, or helping patients understand the importance of vaccines, or making decisions to see family and friends safely. 
every scenario poses deep ramifications for health. A few weekends ago, I actually was looking at some news uh, last month on, on my iPhone. And as I was scrolling down the screen, you know, I noticed there were stories about COVID-19. And then there was a hurricane devastation that still the, the area in the, that was impacted by Hurricane Ida was addressing, followed by the Afghan crisis. I mean, it is clear that um, in that in that article uh, that I was reading, all of those articles, it took it took all those crises took humanity off guard. You know, we operate under this ethos and this thinking that it's bigger and faster will always get us to where we need to go, but the map does not show us where we're headed. And certainly, um, this map doesn't show us necessarily where we're having where we're headed. The weather may show us, um, and certainly COVID-19 rate, rates right now tell us where we're going. But the writing is on the wall, and it's time for us to make sure we're prepared. This sort of see what happens approach is no longer an option. We can't hit the snooze button anymore. We have to be wide awake. And we can no longer afford to wait to see what happens next. So in closing, it is our time in nursing. You know, working together in a community of solidarity, we can end this pandemic and we can build a healthier, safer world. And just as influenza shaped our history and our profession, our profession COVID-19 will be a story of science, discovery, and how we change the way we think in the face of crises. It should be the turnkey moment for nursing. Let us look back to learn how to look forward. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral or Orsega, for your most inspiring words, and thank you so much for your service. Um, this was really an empowering presentation by Admiral Orsega, and I think uh, we have our marching orders, so to speak. Many additional, many additional thanks are in order for this event. To my, to my practice colleagues at UI Health, thank you once again for your continued and invaluable support and collaboration in helping to orchestrate this event. Thank you again to UI Health and to all of our 2021 sponsors for their generous support of our celebration of nursing leadership in Illinois. Thank you to my colleagues on the host committee. Your time on this committee is much appreciated. To the students and the staff who worked today's event from Oak Point University, Loyola University, Chicago, Marcella Niehoff School of Nursing and Rush University College of Nursing, I thank you. To my team at UIC College of Nursing, the staff, the faculty, and students who worked diligently in coordinating this event and all of the details and all of the logistics, most of all, Katie Corboy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to remind you that group photo opportunities are still available until 2.30. Keep your eye on your email for a link to today's photos. Also share your own photos and memories with UIC Nursing by using the hashtag PNL Illinois on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can see your program for more information. It's really been my distinct pleasure to host this event today. I hope that today provided you with new insights and new innovations that you'd like to put into practice. I also hope that you'll leave with an unshakable appreciation for the strength of our collective power as nurse leaders. Please save the date to join us next year 
Friday, November 4th, 2022. Finally, one last tradition before we adjourn, we would like to present this afternoon's centerpieces courtesy of ANA Illinois. Please look on the back of your program that was on your chair when you arrived at your table. One program at each table has a red sticker. If you have that sticker, then you get to take home the beautiful centerpiece on your table. <laughs> so thank you so much for attending. Stay safe, and we'll see you next year.